Most of you are wondering how the world of God of War works. How do the creation stories all fit together? How did Kratos reach Midgard? All these questions and more have their answers rooted in the world's cosmology. In this video, the first section will deal with the statements and explanations given by the creators of God of War, and you will see how it paints a single cohesive picture. The links to these will be present in the description or pinned comment. Why do we need developer statements, you may ask? This is because the official material never gives an explanation, thus necessitating explanations from the developers themselves. Section 2 will show all of the statements from official material in the franchise that could be relevant. Do note that some of these must be taken with a grain of salt at the very least, and care must be taken to avoid taking literary hyperbole as factual statements. To put it bluntly, the accuracy of any claim within the God of War universe is inherently questionable, primarily because these narratives are relayed second-hand and lack empirical validation, much like those in various belief systems globally. Each creation story is not a precise recount of historical events, but rather exaggerated tales passed down through generations. These creation stories do have a tiny hint of validity beyond what actually happened, granted to them by the power of belief, as you will see Corey explain. By their very nature, these myths cannot be considered scientifically accurate or interpreted literally as they represent a version of the game of telephone, where the original message is progressively distorted over time. It's untenable to claim that the visual representations of scenes in the games, depicting events outside the main setting in the past, future, or any other timeline, are accurate. These visuals are not designed to be faithful reconstructions of historical events, but are artistic interpretations meant to enhance the gaming experience. One last point before we start. As you will see Corey Barlog explain, all of the developers, part of the team handling the Norse saga, know how the cosmology works. So please don't waste everyone's time arguing in the comments that a developer isn't trustworthy. Will you help us attack Asgard? I await the call. But what I would talk about was the idea that all the mythologies of the world are kind of like this Hubble telescope image. They are like galaxies individually spread out throughout a, a complete universe. And the world is the universe. And all the mythologies are sort of origin stories of various cultures throughout the world, beginning at the beginning of time and stretching all the way out. So at, at any given time, all the mythologies exist together concurrently, and they are simply separated by geography. So it's important because some people had the conception that, hey, Kratos at the end of God of War III destroyed the world. Well, he destroyed the, what they believed the world was in Greece, which was their world. Everybody believed their world was the only world. In fact, we still believe that today. In the world, right, in the real world, all of these mythologies are sort of origin stories of cultures separated by geography, right? And they exist from the beginning of time, telling these, these civilization stories all the way out so that if in the time of, of the gods you were to travel around the world it's like traveling around the world now and interacting with you know different people but those people happen to be gods in the mythological times and monsters all around that all of the mythologies exist on this planet simultaneously they're all creation stories that date all the way back to the beginnings of the planet itself but these are the cultures sort of creation story of that culture but they are sort of simultaneously coming up in different geographic locations on on the earth and and somebody moving between all of those in a time when it was far more about the gods wandering the earth uh, is connecting all of that together. Here's a dumb question. Do you consider in the God of War mythology, are these mythologies sprouting out because people believe in them or are they sprouting up independent from humans? I think it's independent. Okay. But I think there is a power of the belief as well that continues on it, right? It's maybe a little bit of that Sam Neill Merlin movie, right? Where everybody decides to forget magic and stop believing in it and it goes away. There is a sense that in our world, the Norse gods existed far before the, the, the Viking times, right? So that basically there's all this talk in the, the, the era of the Vikings of the Vikings fighting for Odin and Thor and, and Freya, uh, but they were abandoned by these guys because they're not around, right? But they were around long, long, long before in a time when it was far more barren uh, in Northern Europe. And basically, that's our time, right? Our time in which they are connecting. But, you know, in Egypt, 
the pharaohs were sort of the, the living embodiment of the gods during a time when it was very crowded for humans. So there's an interesting sort of connection with each mythology. It's slightly different, right? It's slightly different in which their creation story comes about. Is there a lore bible? Do you really get up in your head? And does the team get up in their head about how does this larger universe of God of War fit together with different mythologies? Do you guys have those ideas locked down? Yeah, we actually created a, a, a timeline that talks about during the Greek era, the ending of the Greek era, the period of time in between, and all the time leading up, what was going on in sort of the Norse myth, and how it's all connecting, and all sort of the pre-things happening. So even things we're not covering in the game are indicated little bits here and there. Uh, but if developers wanted more of the lore background, there is a Bible somewhere that says like, all right, around this area is when this mythology bubbled up and so therefore it exists. Yeah, we have it fairly closely guarded in the sense that uh, there are a few people that have it, but we don't want to have too many people starting to, to dig into other areas. Uh, but to keep everything consistent, we have that fantastic timeline that helps everybody understand. Yeah. Um, is there anything to that? Are there other pantheons in this universe that Kratos might go explore? Oh, totally. Like, I've always looked at this universe as... You know, like our world, right? It is uh, the the geography separates the the cultural mythologies, right? The cultural mythologies are stories of the zero point to present day. These are the the, the birth and the origin of these cultures. So that that Norse mythology exists in Scandinavia, and simultaneously across the world, the Mayan mythology has its origins, right? These are cultural stories about how they explain the the sort of birth of their cultures, and I think. As I look at the the, the the whole world, that that each of these gods had their own domains, right? The same way that countries have their own domains and their own and their leaders, own special their own fighting laws. moves and their own special sweet and their own special something. fighting moves and their own upgrade trees, <laughs> right? <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like it, it it is it is a consistent single universe. I think that as we start to look at these things, there's little bits here and there that let you know, like tier. Uh, had connections to a lot of other pantheons. And there is references in Norse mythology of gods interacting with Roman gods, right? It's very small, it's very minimal in their their sort of connections, but it shows that there was a, an awareness. You know, Egyptian was always fascinating to me. Uh, it, it, it sort of had a, a, a geography problem of if he's going to want to get away from his past, that's not far enough yeah. away, right? And there's also these great stories within there that, you know, the pharaohs are kind of like the physical manifestations of the gods, right? That the gods, talking about the gods even walking the earth, they never really were doing that. A lot of it was the, the, the sort of living in other worlds. So there was some interesting stuff. One scene later on in the game where you find that missing piece from that ruin, which uh, was it, what Trace was reading, it was like, oh, there's a piece missing, and then it's the one depicting, I think, Tyr in the middle of, ah, it's yeah, like the, yeah. the Greek symbol for, it's like the Omega symbol for yeah, war yeah, or whatever. Yeah. So we were theorizing Basically, like, is that kind of, like you said, like, Norse was the first mythology you want to go to, but then you also see um, the Triskelion, Triskelion, Tr 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 and then you see the Eye of Horus. I might be butchering which these are. Is that intent maybe down the road to build a larger universe outside of just Greek and Norse? There is a connection to that. It, it, its first goal was to show how Tyr connected to all of these other mythologies. Tyr was kind of the first god of war within the Norse realm. It kind of got screwed over by the gods, right? And, and sort of pushed aside, and Odin kind of took over in that respect. And we portrayed him as this interesting kind of like the, the more beloved god, the god who actually uh, connected to other mythologies, other cultures, and was trying to unify and bring them together, but the kind of rabble-rousers of the Aesirs sort of ruined that. And there's these references in the mythology of actually having certain characters actually reference or interact with, say, the Roman gods, which I thought was always fascinating that I don't know if it's simply a later translation or even when the, the Christians started to move Norse mythology to uh, away from paganism and more towards Christianity, that maybe they had folded some of these things in. But I always love the idea that on the planet, you know, since the beginning of time, all these cultures are having their origin stories, right? And geography is separating all of them so that concurrently all these mythologies are going on, right? There isn't one that says, this is how everything was. It was, this is how this culture was brought up and this culture was brought up in this way. And who knows if they were to crisscross and have some crazy Norse and Egyptian and Mayan Justice League of people. I originally started pitching this to people um, and, and saying, you know, the mythologies of the world are sort of cultural origin stories separated by geography, 
So when you think about the mythologies, I, I say the visual is the, the, the Hubble telescope image of all the, the, the galaxies, right? That, that super long exposure shot that shows all the galaxies of the world as part of a whole universe, right? And I think you look at the planet and it is really just these myth mythological stories all over the world that kind of exist at the beginning of time all the way into present. So, you know, historically in their timelines, you know, it's a lot of these stories are about before man. Right, so that they're like, this happened before, and we were talking about what this was. So these connections to all of that was, okay, when he leaves Greece, he is leaving sort of the, 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 the sort of ecosphere of this mythology, but there are so many others that exist all over the place, and that when he goes to Scandinavia, he ends up in Scandinavia, um, it is kind of this line of demarcation, right? This sort of BC AD change uh, to, okay, it is still him, but he has entered into this sort of new belief system, right? It is like going to another country, right? That, you know, everyone's speaking a different language. There is a different sort of set of rules and cultural norms, right? Uh, it's just, it happens to be that there's a bunch of gods hanging around with a bunch of monsters hanging around. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, I remember you saying not that long ago that this is this version of Kratos, but you could delve into other mythologies with him in the future. Yeah. And, put in, and I think that's really interesting because it's something that, you know, it, having him be part of one and the idea that it would overlap is jarring, but also really interesting. It's like you can do a lot of weird stuff there yeah. with different mythologies just intertwining. And so. having like even slight tangential connections, like I, I very, very, very intentionally have this period of time from the end of three to the beginning of this game in which we don't tell anybody how long it is, right? Mm -hmm. I know how long it is. The writers know how long it is. No one else. Dwarves, like I have like very like cursory North mythology knowledge, but dwarves are like by far the thing I need the least about going into this game. Um, I find it really interesting, the idea of them traveling between realms so easily. Um, what, because obviously like they give you access to the gateways, which within a realm allow you to sort of fast travel, but like you, you still rely on the Bifrost to go between realms. like. What what is the mythology behind dwarves traveling so easily? Uh, this also connects to gnomes uh, and dwarves, and this idea that in some of the stories they would show the gnomes or the dwarves run behind a rock and then disappear, and they wouldn't know where they went. So we sort of take next steps of how we're interpreting the the realms, because the realms are all basically, you know nine realms that look very similar to this on the same sort of space and then you move between them like dimensions right uh and they are just able to without the use of a bifrost move between these realms the way i, I kind of see the uh, the mythologies is kind of like that uh hubble telescope image hmm. of all the galaxies the right? ultra deep field yeah. yeah so that image shows the universe with all of its individual galaxies. Each galaxy is kind of like uh, a representation of a mythology, mm. you know, and sort of wrap that around the Earth. And at any given moment, all of these mythological belief systems uh, existed. You know, they all deal with a creation myth around their region. It's just separated by geography. Mm. So that while the height of some of these mythological beliefs are at different time periods, uh, a lot of them kind of align with a, a single point mm. in time. Uh, maybe this one, we're not really in the Viking era. Right. A lot yeah, of people yeah. think Norse, they think Viking, but there's really this amazing prehistory, sort of the migration, uh, and then prior to that, the pre-migration era, where in the Viking era, they always talked about the gods have abandoned us. Mm. Thor and Loki and Odin all walk the earth at one point, but yeah. they're not around anymore. Uh, they fight for them, but they're not there. And uh, this idea that we're at is, is saying we're at a prehistory point when the gods did walk the earth, mm. when, when monsters were real before they became extinct. It's kind of cool. It's a fun space to be in because it allows us to paint our own image of Norse mythology as opposed to anyone else's. So what I was setting up into was this idea that Athena had died and was the first person in the pantheon of gods to actually have a selfless act to die from a selfless act. So she had kind of ascended to this higher level. And then at first she's somewhat altruistic and be like, hey, wow, okay, I did pretty good. But then she starts to realize, wait a minute, I can actually affect the rest of the world. I don't want anybody else to get up here. The, the arc of Athena was the most important arc of the entire series, at least when I started working on it, was to kind of show that she was the one Greek god who did something selfless. She sacrificed herself to protect Zeus and that actually allowed her to ascend to a higher realm and she ended up realizing, oh look, there's more power up here. So it sort of corrupts her a little bit and then she's sort of, 
you know, orchestrating the demise of the other gods. A lot of the times the gods were sort of metaphors and, and stories about the corruption of power, right? When you have that much power, that much sort of absolute control, it's very easy to start sliding. And Kratos was the example of how far he can fall when he's given all that power. God of War 2 really explored that sense of he really went way off the deep end and became worse than Ares. She was selfless. She died protecting Zeus, right? But in that selfless act, she was the first god to be selfless. And that was allowing her to ascend to a higher plane. She ends up going into a place that is higher than everybody else and it totally messes with her head. It be she becomes just as bad as everybody else because she experiences a power greater than everybody so that it is kind of always that, that messy. I have to address a few points related to this particular statement from Corey, as people often misunderstand it. When asked if Midgard is the Earth or the entire universe, Corey says it's just Scandinavia on Earth putting down both options and denying them if we rephrase it. Before we go ahead, note that universe has multiple meanings, with the second one, aside from the obvious first, being a particular sphere of activity or experience. As you have seen from his previous explanations, the second definition is in agreement with what he has said. Anyways, Corey says that they have all carved out their piece of history. When talking about the universe, though, they are, in my mind, referring to the universes that they have dominion over. The greater actual universe has yet to be explored. Here, Corey puts the word universe in quotation marks when discussing the universes over which the gods have dominion. As he isn't quoting what someone said, referring to a literary title or such, the act of putting the word in quotation marks shows that the validity of that word is doubted, and considering that universe can mean domain, the sphere of activity, control, etc., the latter definition holds the best as compared to that which is commonly proffered. He also says that the actual universe, not multiverse, has yet to be explored. Okay, this is where, I don't know if you have to light a joint for this question or what, but okay, thinking about realms, how this stuff works, are all of the realms, okay, I guess the question is, is Midgard all of the Earth, or is it just that one area? Like, does a section of Midgard extend all the way to Greece? Is there a version of Asgard, which probably we weren't talking about yet, that also en envelops the entire world? Basically, do the realms from Norse mythology expand beyond Norse mythology, is the question. In my mind, you can contradict, and I don't think we ever necessarily said for certain, but like, Midgard is Earth. It's, all of Earth. You know, it's, it's all of Earth or whatever, but like, the people who are involved in Norse mythology, who, who worship those gods and whatever, are in this section of Earth. And to them, you know, Midgard is is to them what to the Greeks, uh, whatever they want, Gaia or the, the Earth or whatever was to them. You know, it's that's it's just Earth to me. I, I didn't I didn't think of them when I was writing anything as completely separate places. Yeah. So yeah, pretty much. Yeah. But and Kratos got on a boat and went north, and he found himself in this land that people happen to call Midgard. Okay, so it's not like in Elfheim, if you keep walking, you can eventually get to the Egyptian version of Elfheim, which would be very trippy and cool. I guess you theoretically could, because all of our realms, I mean, we, we established they exist, like Freya says, they exist in the same physical space. They're essentially just kind of like, you know, dimensions uh, on top of each other. That's why the, the the temple, the realm temple, and the bridge can all exist. They, it all it exists in all the realms. All the towers, all those things exist in the same realm. So, if you if you uh, were inside the light temple in I, uh, in Alfheim, and you could theoretically travel right from there you to Muspelheim or Niflheim or any of those places, you would be in that location.
you know, you saw the Titan in the desert with the secret ending. I was going to ask we you were, that, yeah. We were, all, we were always going to go back and make like a game based on that. There was, um, you know, the brother eventually did get uh, utilized in one of the PSP or Vita games uh, that was sent out to the, the woods to die. Um, so, you know, there were definitely um, uh, story points that, that I had and that Corey had, and I think to some extent Stick had said, you know, let's let's lay these down, and if we're fortunate enough, we can get to go back and, and talk about them and make games about them. So you think a modern God of War game would work? Because you set up the, the Chronos uh, cutscene at the end, where you saw the yep. modern times and helicopters were just flying to it. Did you have a story mapped out, like an idea, a seed? Yeah, I mean, it wasn't it wasn't going to be Kratos. I mean, we had you know we had a very long plan that Kratos would eventually become the Grim Reaper, and the new gods would rise up: Christianity, uh, Islam, Judaism, and he would have you know killed himself with the Blades of Chaos after he destroyed all the old gods. Uh, but he was resurrected, and they turned the the, the uh, Blades of Chaos into the Grim Reaper scythe. And since then, he's kind of been walking the earth as the Grim Reaper, sort of giving people death, right? Okay. And so that was sort of his branch. But then the, the thing in the desert was almost more like it was going to be like a a spinoff. It was going to take place in the God War universe, but it was going to be more almost like a, a, a shooter military kind of thing, uh, sort of almost like Prometheus or something, where they find this this thing in the desert and they have to go inside it. So and there's a whole crate. The, yeah, they, and it would be, and it would just be, you know, obviously decayed and destroyed and full of, you know, innards and all this shit. And it would be like a horror shooter military thing, but it would have it would have been, you know, born in the. It'd be like a, you know, not a shared universe, although it would be. We weren't thinking in those terms back then, but it would have been like a, it would have been like a spinoff. This is something we talk about a lot on the channel, and it's it's the God of War universe. Like, when yeah. you wrote the story of the game, and the end of the of the first game, Kratos becomes the God of War, and he's the God of War throughout all ages, and we see images flashing of, like, the Civil War, the, the Inquisition, uh, World War yeah. One. <laughs> so, in your idea of the God of War universe, there's only the Greek pantheon, and then there's Norse mythology, but in another realm completely, or is it shared kind of like, like it is now? Kratos just walked from Greece to Scandinavia. It, it, all I knew was that other gods existed besides the Greek gods because that was sort of going to be what the sequels were about um, and about how Kratos ultimately found a way to destroy all the gods and killed them all. And he realized that, you know, until I take out all of them, I will never have peace and humanity will never have peace. Not that he cared about that, but he's like, these are a bunch of manipulative fucks and they're petty and fuck them. And I finally figured it out. So. All I knew is I needed to bring in Norse and Egyptian and African and, uh, well, depending on what country in Africa, but a, a, a number of, uh, uh, although I guess Egypt, but I, I mean more like uh, uh, there was one country we were looking at in Africa that was was had a really rich uh, mythology in terms of monsters that was like, that would be really cool, really? Uh, but I forget the name of the country. Um, but, but all I knew is those mythologies needed to exist um, and Kratos needed to be able to go over and kill them um, and, and fight them and engage with them. And so um, whether or not they were linked by magical portals or whether they were literally if Kratos was able to, 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 to you know, maybe that he, he had to somehow capture Pegasus and Pegasus would be the thing that could get him to these other, you know, were, I, I have, we never thought about it. We just, we just knew they would be they, things would be um, okay. that would be, yeah, be part of it. Yeah. I got you, I got you, okay. In the Greek domain, the underworld and mortal world are not separate universes or anything of the sort, as Kratos has entered and exited it multiple times through climbing and falling. Some say that Kratos did so through portals, yet nothing of the sort is even remotely implied, stated, or shown anywhere. At best, this idea relies on its claim being true, some reason for the complete lack of anything about these portals' existence, instead of having any supporting evidence. I will show these instances here. In this first clip, note how roots from plants in the mortal world extend down to the underworld. As he stepped to the edge to begin his descent, a new sound filled the air, drowning out the cries of those unfortunates falling to the underworld. He jumped back in time to avoid being crushed by a heavy block. A grim smile curled Kratos' lips. Tied to the block was a rope that vanished upward. Gathering his strength, he bent his legs and exploded upward, grasping the rope as far above as possible. Hand over hand, he continued his escape as he went through dozens, or thousands, of weapons looted from the corpses of his enemies. The underworld behind him vanished as he clambered higher, finally seeing a ceiling above. Kratos wondered at what appeared to be roots dangling from the bottom. As he got closer, he saw that they were roots. Roots of living plants from the world above. The living world above. Kratos climbed faster and followed the rope into a hole that blocked all senses. His shoulders brushed dirt, and then the hole narrowed even more. But the rope still stretched taut above him. Ascending more slowly, he felt himself being crushed and smothered. And he knew the smell in his nostrils and the taste in his mouth. Dirt. Clay. Earth. 
He spat out a mouthful of grit and sealed his lips. With an effort greater than he'd ever before believed he could summon, Kratos forced his hands and then his arms to move. He pressed his limbs outward, using his great strength to pack the smothering earth away from him, opening a little room to work. He began to move his legs as well, struggling to bend his knees or widen his stance. His heart hammered, and his lungs burned for air. As the life drained out of Kratos, the arms of Hades reached out to claim their prize. But there was more resting on Kratos' shoulders than he could know. Kratos was destined to bring about change so severe that he would shake the very pillars of Mount Olympus. His death is something that I could not allow. of your life, but I can no longer simply watch. We will help you defeat Zeus. Death is an escape, Kratos. You are a warrior of Sparta, not a coward. Only a coward accepts death. I am no coward. Then you must fight. I will show you the way to the Sisters of Fate. Only with their power will you defeat Zeus.
gods the sisters have sent you to help me. I realize now. The sister's temple is far above Kratos. You must get back to the surface. You killed my daughter, Spartan. And now you will suffer for it. The domain of death. A dark nether world nestled between the land of the living and the realm of the dead. A purgatory ruled by the god of death. The doors to the domain of death, a place neither mortal nor god had dared enter. Worshipped long before the Olympians, Thanatos, the god of death, dwelt. The domain of death is often said to be a separate universe or dimension. While Kratos does use a portal to reach it, the portal by itself only makes the idea plausible. It doesn't prove it on its own. Furthermore, Thanatos and Kratos jumped from the domain into the mortal world. And we see yellow flashes from where they enter the clouds, which may or may not indicate magic or portals. But again, none of this is enough to claim that it's a separate universe. Thanatos and other primordials have their realms. The information we have on them is so sparse, any claims made besides what is directly stated are unsound. Brother, whose voice was that we heard when Valhalla sent us back from the throne? You heard it also. Aye. Said he owes you a debt, was it? Someone who might lend us a hand, perhaps? Unlikely. He was a god of Greece, and we did not part on good terms. And by that you mean... Yes, I see. No shortage of bitter old ghosts in these parts. These parts being your memory, of course. An infamous ad. One they still spoke of in the years of rebuilding. I somehow doubted they meant it so literally. I'll give you this, brother. Your technique has improved immeasurably. I needed his power to secure my vengeance against the gods. I believed I had no choice. No choice? You could have not ripped my head off my body. That was absolutely an option. And he's back. But that wasn't the worst of it, was it, Kratos? Killing me deprived Greece of the sun. They were plunged into perpetual cold and darkness. Crops ceased to grow. Famine descended on our homeland. Not that you cared. Enough. 
Tell me, Kratos. Truly. How did it feel to plunge your homeland into darkness? I did not intend the lad to suffer. But I was indifferent. Consumed only by rage and retribution. That is not what I asked. How did it feel, in that moment, your soul given over to darkness? Bringing a darkness over everything you could see. It felt... true. Wait, is that you restoring the sun? You took Helios' chariot and put the sun back in the sky, but sacrificed yourself in the process. Yes, I fell to my death and was saved by Helios. But this memory happened before I killed him. My evils were yet to come. What is the point? That your legacy has always been a complicated one. That goodness is not a destination we arrive at, but a practice. Misfortune may drive anyone to darkness. We resist it only through wisdom and vigilance. You are not so unskillful now as you were then. Better voices in your head, you might call it. You can see how all the little realm spaces connect to the higher plane. And those statues are certainly imposing. I recognize them. They are judges of the underworld, from my homeland. Ah, well, you sound thrilled to see them again. I brought something else to keep things interesting. You're not the only one with weapons from far off lands, you know. Ready? Yes, these you dwell on. But it's not that simple, is it? The horde is vast, brother. What would have happened if you didn't stop it? Our lands would have been overrun. Our people killed, violated. People your army was sworn to protect. An army led by you. Did you not feel a duty to fulfill your purpose? Did you not fear for the safety of your homeland? When Helios was captured by the God of Dreams, the lands fell into darkness and were not restored until his return. I knew exactly what would happen. Well, uh, let's see. A journal entry from a secret of the Oracle. Oh, here we go. I have come from the land of the Pharaoh. It is so cold here. If I return home without seeing her, it will mean my death. Why do they leave these short-ass notes? More Pharaohs even around back then? Well, anyway. Where do we go? Spark of the world. Which is... The place where Niflheim and Muspelheim meet. Where the first realms came into existence. This one mentions places I've never heard of. Seems Tyr really liked to travel. Tyr believed the mind, not might, was key to preventing war and chaos. And he also knew visiting other cultures would give him perspective staying in one place could not. While Odin always hoarded knowledge, guarding it jealously, Tyr was open and sharing with his learning and his wisdom. For this, mortals adored Tyr, showing their love by bringing him gifts the world over. Well... This is most unexpected. Why? What does it mean? I haven't the foggiest. Isn't that unexpected? Head. Look, clearly that's Tear. Traveling somehow. Perhaps magically. But what's that to do with the giants that they should devote a shrine to it? I'm afraid that is none too clear. What are those runes in the corners? Not runes. Symbols from different lands. They mean... War. Aye. How do you... This one I know too well. Oh. The truth. The truth. I'm a god, boy. From another land far from here. When I came to these shores, I chose to live as a man. But the truth is, I was born a god. And so were you. That's from a great desert land very far from here. The gods live there? Oh my, yes. Many, many gods. Good or bad? Not as simple as that, I'm afraid. And on this day, 
Kratos had been called upon by the gods to confront an unthinkable evil, unleashed on the city of Attica by the invading Persian army. Many people claim that the Yggdrasil is infinite. The statement in the novel uses the phrase, like a tree branch stretching out to infinity, as a simile to the strange environment that is the realm between realms mentioned in the previous part of the sentence. In this case, the novel is not using infinity as an adjective. It's instead being utilized as a noun in the sentence to indicate a destination of sorts for the branch to go to, rather than a quantity being applied to the branch itself. Grammatically, stretching out to something doesn't mean you reach what you're stretching towards. For example, a kid can reach out towards the moon, yet we all know he won't reach it. You can see a more detailed explanation on the screen right now. Do note that all of this his is not from Kratos' perspective. Rather, it is the narrator referring to the observable standpoint from the doorway into the realm, between realms from where Kratos is located. Bruno has also stated that the tree is not infinite. It is also stated in the game that the branches of the tree will break and fall off under their own weight if they grow too large. So them being infinite isn't even a possibility. Hello, I have a task for you actually. Speak. The tree has become rather overgrown. And? And if it grows too wildly, the branches risk getting too heavy and falling which is not ideal, considering they hold all the realms. All the realms exist in the same physical space, reflections of each other. These doors, the towers outside, and the nine realms are all intertwined and coexisting on the branches of the world tree, separated only by the Bifrost light of Alfheim. The nine realms are stated multiple times to exist in the same physical space, thus refuting the claim that they are separate spaces. Physical space is defined as a universe. Some people claim that the Yggdrasil is the physical space, but that would mean that the realms exist in the Yggdrasil, but we know they exist on its branches instead. So this claim is more of an issue understanding the grammatical implications of itself than anything else. The Gallahorn Codex entry states that portals bridge the space between two realms. Thus, we can conclude that the realms aren't separate spaces, but rather physical structures in a space. The realms physically meet. To say that they exist in separate space-time continuums is a logical and factual contradiction. Where do we go? Spark of the world. Which is? The place where Niflheim and Muspelheim meet. Where the first realms came into existence. Matter exists in space-time, so if the space-time continuums are separate as necessary for being different universes, matter in one universe must never interact with matter in another. There are arguments for the realms being separate space-time continuums because time flows at different rates in each realm, but time dilation on its own is far from enough to substantiate this claim. Furthermore, Freya says that the realms are separated only by the Bifrost light of Alfheim, which we have seen as the cause of differing flows of time. Except, I don't mean that. You know I love him. I just wish he was better. I know he can be. So if he tries, I'll try. But if he doesn't, please come back. I know your other son. I didn't know what 
to do? You left me here again. <coughs> Why don't you care? I... That's impossible. You may be wondering why Egypt, Greece, and other regions were mentioned as part of Midgard in the God of War cookbook. This is simply because to the Norse people, a different realm is one separated from them by the Bifrost light of Alfheim, and the rest of the earth is not separated by the light from the Norse pantheon's geographical domain. As Matt Sophos put it, Midgard and Gaia are all on earth, but the people involved with Norse and Greek mythology are in different geographical sections of the earth. It's just Earth. He didn't think of them when he wrote them as separate places. Another common idea is that timelines mentioned in the God of War card game are universes. To put it simply without wasting time, nothing even remotely indicates that the timelines are physically realized or are universes. Good for you, Seekram. I think maybe it's time I traveled, experienced these realms and the lands beyond, not as Valhalla's emissary, but as a person. That's perfect. You've always dreamed of a grand sea voyage, seeing the world. Perhaps I could go with you. I've been told I'm a useful guide. Perhaps. But let's not distract Kratos further. Master Kratos, friends, what can I do for you? I was curious, my dear fellow. You come from lands beyond these, do you not? Yes. I was wondering, who tended your world tree back home? My home had no world tree. No, oh, you had no... Without, how? How did one travel from realm to realm? On foot or by sea. Good God, man! No wonder you left! Sentry! Be careful and stay behind me! You... It's Ragnarok. He's here. Thank you for watching. Hope you enjoyed the video. Don't forget to like, share, and subscribe. See you later, alligator.